thank you for joining us on our Made Local series to celebrate the publication of Andy Norman's much lauded book, Mental Immunity, Infectious Ideas, Mind Parasites, and the Search for a Better Way to Think. We are so honored to launch this book, which has been called Important, Provocative, and Just What Humanity Needs. Hello, I'm Stephanie Flom, Executive Director of Pittsburgh Arts and Lectures. Welcome. Made Local is presented in partnership with the Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh. Thank you to the library. And thanks to White Whale Bookstore, where you can purchase signed copies of Andy's book. Andy Norman will be introduced by his friend, colleague, fellow philosopher and author, Lee McIntyre. With connections to Boston University and Harvard, Lee published numerous scholarly books before deciding to expand his audience and his contribution to our nation's dialogue. His books for general audiences include Dark Ages, Respecting Truth, and Post-Truth. Lee is happy that he is still teaching philosophy, just on a larger stage. It is our honor to welcome Lee McIntyre to our stage. Lee? Hello, my name is Lee McIntyre. I've known Andy Norman for 40 years, and I couldn't be happier to be asked to give the introduction today for the launch of his terrific new book, Mental Immunity. Two of the things I admire most about Andy are his ambition and his humility. To write a book like this, I think you need both, and I think that Andy is one of the few people on the planet who could have pulled this off. His topic is nothing less than how to save ourselves and others from the sorts of dangerous ideas that have been feeding off all the polarization, conflict, and violence that we've been watching gather strength over the last few decades, and which now threatens, I think, our democracy itself. Andy's respect for the power of reason has been part of him really ever since I met him in college. But it's one thing to study an issue, and it's another to do something about it. And what you find in mental immunity is a philosopher at the full height of his powers employing a razor-sharp intellect to get to the bottom of a problem, and then using his prodigious communication skills to show us what part we can play in solving it. One of the great things about Andy is that he's never condescending. He's never the professor giving a lecture. Instead, he wants to bring you in on a little secret that he's discovered, and damn it, he just has a way of making you want to go along with him, even if it means rethinking some of the things that you'd prefer not to revisit, or giving up some beliefs that you'd prefer to keep. That's the thing about Andy. He doesn't just make you feel smarter. He inspires you to be better. I don't have faith in a lot of things lately, but I have faith in this book. I don't know who it was in the history of medicine who discovered the body's immune system, but I think we know who's responsible for kicking us off our chairs to realize that mental immunity is just as real. This isn't an analogy. Our cognitive immune system is part of the human mind that's been developing along with us and our civilization over the centuries, and we can either nurture it and cultivate it, or we can ignore it and squander it. It's up to us. Fortunately, we've got the best possible guidebook right now in our hands to prevent that from happening. All we have to do is open it, and join Andy in the latest iteration of how philosophy can help us to save the world. Thanks very much. Good evening. Thank you all for tuning in. Thank you to Stephanie and her team at Pittsburgh Arts and Lectures. It's a privilege to be part of your lecture series. And thanks most of all to you, Lee, who saw what this book could become before I did. Your tough love feedback was just what it needed. And though I cursed your name for over a year, during an excruciating rewrite process. I love you like a brother. So Fred the Flat Earther dies and goes to heaven. St. Peter meets him at the pearly gates and says, Fred, it's your lucky day. You're customer number 100. You get an audience with God. So Fred strides boldly into God's inner sanctum and says, God, my entire life, I've promoted flat earth theory. I just have to know, is the world flat or is it round? God does a face palm, shakes his head and says, sorry to say, Fred, but the world is very round. 
Fred's face registers shock and then recognition. And he says, this conspiracy goes higher than I thought. So in my book, which is due out, and actually came out, I guess, will have come out uh, just a couple of weeks ago, Mental Immunity, I show that Fred's mind was infected by a species of mind parasite. That his mind had an immune system that failed to filter out the idea that the Earth is flat, and that his conspiratorial mindset actually constitutes a kind of mental immune disorder. In fact, it actually amounts to an autoimmune disorder of the mind, whereby the mind's antibodies, in this case, it takes the form of, of suspicion, where those are mobilized to actually combat information that threatens his flat earth worldview. Now, of course, I'm not talking here just about Fred. The book actually makes a series of fairly bold claims that I think have the potential to transform the human condition. Here they are. Mental, I'm sorry, mind parasites really do exist. Um, in fact, they've been, every bad idea is a mind parasite. And we're all prone to mind infections because we all harbor bad ideas, bad and false ideas. Now, all of us have mental immune systems that function more or less well to prevent our minds from becoming infected by bad ideas. In fact, our minds had to evolve resistance to the wrong ideas because going way back in evolutionary history, the wrong ideas could get you killed. So our mental immune systems function imperfectly and I conjecture in the book that they're actually functioning at a fraction of their full capacity to enlighten, enlighten us and make us wiser versions of ourselves. There is in fact an emerging science of mental immunity. I call it cognitive immunology. And it's teaching us how mental immune systems work, why they fail, and how we can make them work better. They're revealing why mental immune systems break down, why conspiracy thinking, science denial, divisive ideologies, why these are flourishing in our time and raging through internet connected populations. And the ideas of mental, of cognitive immunology form a lens that brings our post-truth predicament I think, into startlingly clear focus. It reveals the root causes of many forms of crazy, unhinged thinking and points to some real remedies and a way out of what I think of as our disinformation vortex. Now, my last story, my story of Fred the Flat Earther, you might have difficulty fact-checking that one. But here's when you can fact check. In 1976, the evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins wrote a book called The Selfish Gene. And in that book, he coined the concept of a meme. He defined a meme as a bit of behavior that can be copied by imitation and thereby propagate through a human population uh, on time scales that are extremely small compared to evolutionary uh, a biological evolution. His concept of a meme struck a chord, of course, uh, struck a chord, and we now use it to understand the spread of information and disinformation online. Back in the early 1990s, I think it was 1994, Dawkins wrote another essay called Viruses of the Mind. Um, I was asked by the journal Ethics to review a book that contained this essay, and I came away from that essay struck by the idea that minds can become infected, uh, and I walked into my critical thinking class at Hamilton College uh, a few days later, and I asked my students, 
can a mind become infected? And one of them said, you mean a brain? And I said, no, I actually mean a mind. And another student said, well, infected with what? And I said, bad ideas. And the students kind of looked confused for a moment. I said, tell you what, break into groups and discuss it. And then let's come back in 20 minutes and compare our answers. So they did this. And now, again, this was before the internet was really a thing. Uh, and when they came back, they all agreed that it actually made sense to them that bad ideas can infect minds. So I asked a follow-up question. I, say, I said, well, which of your beliefs are legit and which of your beliefs are actually mind infections? This question just left them all speechless. You could have heard a pin drop. And one of them said, is this what we're doing in this critical thinking class? Are we actually studying how we can prevent our own minds from becoming infected? And I said, bingo. That's what critical thinking has been trying to do for decades. Now, fast forward to just last year, 2020, the World Health Organization recently announced that infodemics are a real thing. In fact, they're arguing that we actually have to combat mis uh, an epidemic of misinformation about the COVID vaccine in order to achieve our public health goals um, uh, in terms of trying to arrive at herd immunity to COVID. Ladies and germs, I'm here to announce the arrival of the germ theory of cognitive contagion. It's here and scientists are taking it very seriously. If you're still not convinced that bad ideas really are mind parasites, consider. Parasites require a host. Ideas require a host. Parasites can infiltrate a body. Mind parasites can infiltrate a mind. Parasites can co-opt the copying machinery of the cell, use it to, to generate many copies of itself, which then spread through the body, causing harm, and sometimes induce behaviors that get the infected person to uh, spread that virus or parasite to other bodies through, for example, an infection spreading sneeze. Now, a bad idea can do exactly the same thing to a mind. It can take up residence in a mind, uh, replicate there, and actually induce the person who was infected with that idea to spread copies into other minds, for example, by spreading salacious rumors. Cutting edge scientists are also waking up to the parasitic nature of bad ideas. A team out of Holland has recently concluded that the, own, that the best way to understand the spread of witchcraft beliefs in early modern Europe is to view it as, a, as an infodemic, as the spread of a set of mind parasites. In fact, they argue we actually need the concept of mind parasites to understand how epidemics of unreason like the one that occurred back then, occur. Back in that essay uh, Dawkins wrote in the early 90s, he actually called for a science of information epidemiology. And I'm here to, again to say that that science is here and it's here to stay. I have a second story to tell, and it also begins with that essay by Richard Dawkins called Viruses of the Mind. In that essay, Dawkins remarked that a the six-year-old daughter of a friend of his believed in the tooth fairy. And he remarked that this uh, girl would believe pretty much anything her parents taught her, including ideas about heaven and hell. And he went on to remark that we seem to be born enormously gullible so that we can learn rapidly from our parents, but that when young, we're, we're kind of like immune compromised, which is to say we have very little resistance to false and damaging ideas uh, until we've developed something we might call critical thinking, or what we might call, using the new metaphor, uh, mental immunity to problematic ideas. 
So I actually went on to redesign the critical thinking course I mentioned before, and I challenged my students to go out and research how the body's immune system works, and then ask them to apply what they learned to figuring out how they can strengthen their own mental immune systems. And they came to some lovely conclusions. Among other things, they decided that questions and reasons are the antibodies of the mind. And that if you use them properly, you can do a good job of weeding out bad ideas and hanging on to good ones. But if you use them improperly, you can have the opposite effect and actually compromise your own immunity to bad ideas. I think they were spot on about that. Um, and together we developed a little something I call the reason giving game, um, which is kind of a structured way of, of using reasons and questions in conversation to actually arrive at mutually agreeable solutions um, or, and, and to deepen common understanding. You should have seen how these students came alive when I basically said, all right, guys, we got this game. Go out, and pick a topic that interests you. I want you to go out and play this game. You should have seen them come alive. It was just night and day difference between the more traditional approach to critical thinking that I was employing up to that point which basically involved listing the 101 ways thinking can go wrong. I realized later that I was teaching my students that thinking is like a minefield and I'm turning them off to the process of idea testing. But after they got a hold of this metaphor of mental immunity and the idea that we can actually strengthen that immunity by playing kind of a fun game where we test each other's ideas in a friendly, cooperative way, that we can strengthen our mental immune systems thereby. They became so excited about it. And I actually think that together with their help, we came across a flat out better way to teach critical thinking. Well, my career took a major detour at that point. I actually resigned a tenured professorship and came back to Pittsburgh. Uh, and uh, I think it was one of the best decisions I ever made. Years later, I found myself with some time on my hands, and so I went back and I tried to search for evidence that mental immune systems exist. I mean, hard scientific evidence. And I came across the research of a man named William McGuire. William McGuire uh, is a psychologist who, who, in the early 1960s, got interested in the question, how can we induce resistance to persuasion? So the Korean War had ended in 1953 with an armistice, and uh, a headline uh, drew a lot of attention when nine American POWs declined to, were given their freedom and declined to return to America. Now, the American military, military establishment concluded that these nine POWs must have been brainwashed. And this caught McGuire's interest, and he decided that to defend America and uh, right-thinking uh, ideologies, we actually needed to understand how to induce resistance to uh, demagogic forms of, of, of brainwashing and persuasion. So he did a series of experiments, and he actually found, and this is a fascinating finding, that if you expose a mind to a weakened form of an idea, the mind will actually develop resistance even to stronger versions of the same idea. You'll immediately recognize the analogy to the process of bodily inoculation. McGuire certainly did. So he named his theory inoculation theory. And in the 60 years since, there have been dozens and dozens of studies that show that the mind behaves as if it had an immune system. McGuire and his followers also went on to show that it's actually not very hard to induce resistance to new information. If you know what you're doing, it's not hard to hack mental immune systems and thereby close and manipulate minds. Now, McGuire's research question how can we inoculate minds against new information was, to my thinking, curiously amoral. He didn't seem to care whether the information we were inoculating against was good or bad, true or false. But a new generation of inoculation theorists 
have been asking the question, how do we inoculate minds against misinformation, disinformation, falsehood, conspiracy thinking, um, dangerous ideologies? And they've been able to show that there are ways to strengthen our resistance to bad ideas and bad information. One of their findings is that it's easier to pre-bunk than debunk, easier to prevent a mind infection than to cure one. Another finding uh, is that a good way to uh, help somebody climb out of, say, climate denial is with what they call a truth sandwich. So a truth sandwich might go on science denial might go something like this. There are powerful petrochemical interests out there that want you to believe that climate, say, that climate change is a hoax. That's truth. Think of that as the top layer of bread. So they go online and they spread the idea that climate change really is a hoax. That's the falsehood or the, the, the meat of the truth sandwich. However, uh, it is misleading and it's designed to manipulate you. Climate change is very real and a large majority of scientists uh, accept that it is human caused. That's the truth at the other, other side of the sandwich. It turns out that by exposing people to truth sandwiches, you can actually substantially mitigate their, their susceptibility to, to climate denial uh, and other forms of unhinged thinking. If you're still not convinced that minds have immune systems, uh, I offer the following personal story. I was raised in a family that practically worshipped Martin Luther King as just kind of an exemplar of the pursuit of justice. In fact, I was born just a few days before his famous I Have a Dream speech. And because my mom was nine months pregnant with me, she was unable to make it to, uh, to that march on Washington. Um, years later, after I'd uh, gone off on my own, I came across information that Martin Luther King was a serial philanderer, that he was un unfaithful to his wife. Now, when I heard this, I just refused to believe it. I remember very distinctly what happened in my mind when I, when I learned about this. I was like, my, my first thought was, I bet you J. Edgar Hoover cooked up that story to smear Martin Luther King. Now, I knew that J. Edgar Hoover had actually been spying on Martin Luther King and was worried about his communistic uh, impulses, so that seemed to me a plausible explanation. Well, it turns out that Martin Luther King really was unfaithful to his wife. And yet my mind reacted in a way that tried to attack and neutralize this information that threatened something that was deeply meaningful to me. I now understand that that was my mind's immune system overreacting to try to defend a belief I was uh, enamored of. Um, I, la I later learned also that there's a famous experiment from the history of science where the Russian zoologist Ily Mechnikov took a starfish larva stabbed it with a tangerine thorn, stuck it under a microscope, and watched as white blood cells rushed to the scene of the injury and tried to actually consume the tip of the, of the thorn. He was the first human being ever to witness the body's immune system in action. But if you remember that questions and doubts and reservations and qualms and challenges and objections, if you remember that they are actually the mind's antibodies, you can witness your own mind's immune system in action every time you come across information that feels threatening. I think there's a root cause behind our post-truth predicament. The tree of life. Robert Bowers, the perpetrator of the Tree of Life massacre, suffered from a massive mental immune failure. He was unable to distinguish between right and wrong as a result of this disorder. The 9-11 hijackers, we have very good ev information evidence now that they also suffered from mental immune disorders. 
QAnon followers. Um, I think the Trump's rise to power is best explained as due in part to decades of neglect and abuse of our mental immune systems. Let me just mention a couple ways in which we neglect and abuse those systems. The idea that everyone is entitled to their opinion has been a commonplace of the American ideal for a long time. And yet, this idea was once counterbalanced by the, by the idea that we have responsibilities that, that place constraints on, the, on that right. We've now reached a point where we talk almost exclusively about our rights to believe and our rights to our opinions, and we talk almost not at all about our responsibility to, to have responsible beliefs and opinions. Um, so I argue in the book that the idea that we're entitled to our opinion actually now functions to let people rationalize irresponsible beliefs and ideas and allow them to feel entitled. So there's a sense of cognitive entitlement has pervaded our culture, given us a ready excuse for irresponsible thinking um, and helped to, to cause a kind of society-wide, what I call a cultural immune disorder. Um, and in the book, I go on to identify several other ideas that are wide, have widespread currency in our culture and that serve to weaken our resistance to bad ideas. Um, I think our former president, Donald Trump, provides a, a, a shining example, or, or rather an infamous example, of how it's possible to abuse mental immune systems. So one of the things I learned studying mental immune function, the idea that uh, we have an obligation to yield to better reasons, to change our minds when, when better information or better uh, arguments come along, that that idea is fundamental to a well-functioning society, and it's also fundamental to a well-functioning mental immune system. Uh, so the Nobel Prize winning economist John Maynard Keynes once said, when the facts change, I change my mind. What do you do, sir? He was talking there about what I think of now as the linchpin of the mind's immune system. We have to be willing to back down when, when confronted with better arguments for an opposing position. Otherwise, our minds start to go haywire and our culture starts to go haywire. When Donald Trump announced that he had the largest inauguration in American history, even though there was... Uh, palpable, tons of evidence that was just blatantly false, he was essentially announcing that he was willing to defy this fundamental cultural norm. And when you defy that norm uh, openly and flagrantly in the way that Trump did, you damage mental immune systems. So it might seem we live in a very dark time but the emergence of cognitive immunology fills me with hope. Here's why. We were once at the mercy of infectious microbes like smallpox, the plague, polio, and then the germ theory of disease and the science of immunology came along and changed everything. They literally transformed the human condition. And now we're fortunate to live in a world where we're far less vulnerable to devastating outbreaks of pathogens and our best scientists and public health officials are able to create brand new vaccines uh, for things like COVID in just a matter of months. We're extremely fortunate to live in this time and devastating diseases that once killed tens and hundreds of millions of people are now kept under control by the science of immunology. I believe that cognitive immunology could be similarly transformative of the human condition. But the science by itself can't accomplish this. If we're going to create a world where we have herd immunity 
to cognitive con- the worst forms of cognitive contagion. Everybody needs to do their part. So one question I get a lot when I speak on this subject is, what can I do? What can I do to strengthen my mind's immune system? And what can I do to strengthen the immune systems in my orbit? My short answer is that you can enjoy conversational idea testing with your friends until you get the hang of it, and then gradually practice it more and more with people who aren't your friends and learn not to become defensive when they advance views that are different from yours. I'm actually advocating a process philosophers have lionized for actually thousands of years, namely collaborative idea testing, where we actually investigate together whether an idea merits our loyalty or our acceptance and discard the ones that don't withstand scrutiny. Uh, Philosophers call that process the Socratic method. And in the book, I argue that the Socratic method is actually one of the most powerful mind inoculants ever invented, that we need to get back to using it. And in the same way that scientists have taken um, inoculants and refined them into very powerful vaccines, we can actually take the Socratic method and refine it into something like a very powerful mind vaccine. And in the later chapters of the book, I actually try to do just that and uh, offer what I call the new Socratic method um, as a better way to think and to strengthen our, our individual and collective immunity to bad ideas. Now, when you engage in this conversational idea testing, there's a few things it's important to keep in mind. Um, Number one, listen to your doubts. They're your mind's antibodies, and they're trying to tell you something. Even when a doubt or a reservation or a qualm doesn't defeat the idea under consideration, a lot of times it does call attention to a problematic feature of the idea that it's best to take account of. So understand that that little voice in the back of your head that says, wait a second, something's not quite right here. Learn to listen to that voice and your mental immune system, your mind's immune system will get stronger. Some other tips, Uh, avoid willful belief. It turns out that believing things because you want them to be true as opposed to believing them because you know them to be true, is a good way to compromise your mind's immune system. We now have very good evidence that people who indulge in wishful thinking in some areas of their lives prove more susceptible to conspiracy thinking or science denial or divisive ideologies in other areas of their lives. Um, In fact, there was a study out of Canada just last year by a team led by Gordon Pennycook that basically says, the meta-belief, the beliefs must change in response to evidence. When you begin to compromise your commitment to that idea, you begin to become more susceptible to dangerous mind parasites. Another uh, practical thing you can do is don't hitch your identity to any set of beliefs. There's a phenomenon psychologists called identity protective cognition. And and what it means is that when ideas become very important to you and and central to your identity, then you will become defensive anytime someone raises questions or challenges to those those ideas. In other words, you're setting yourself up for an auto, uh, a cognitive autoimmune overreaction. Um, It's very easy for mental immune system to overreact to information it perceives as identity threatening. And so the number one thing you can do here is rather than identify with a set of beliefs, identify instead with the process of inquire of open, honest inquiry and arriving at truths. So when a scientist actually becomes a scientist, they start to identify with a community of inquiry and they gain a a relatively high degree of resistance to bad ideas. If each and every one of us comes to identify with the process of inquiry, honest inquiry, we become far more immune to bad ideas. Uh, I like to say it's a good idea to treat your beliefs as house guests that might wear out their welcome. 
at any time. Any time. Don't cling to beliefs as heirloom furniture to be handed down the generations. That's a recipe for mental immune dysfunction. Instead, treat the human beings who might have opposing views as the fellow travelers that we need to coexist with on this small planet and treat the beliefs that might push the opposite direction as something you might need to let go of to continue growing as a human being. So when others raise objections to your point of view or challenges to them, make a deliberate attempt not to get defensive. It's quite possible that these questions, these challenges, these objections are opportunities to learn and grow rather than, than threats. Uh, don't treat them as threats, treat them as opportunities and your mind's immune system will get stronger. Another tip, um, always reason to find out, never reason to win. So when culture wars break out, people take sides and they start trying to win those culture wars through argumentation or reasoning. What they end up doing is they start treating reasons as weapons or as shields. But when you do that, you put your mind's immune system into fight or flight mode. You put your mind into fight or flight mode and your body's immune system, your mind's immune system will respond by simply trying to screen out information it views as threatening. This is completely detrimental to the kind of constructive dialogue we need to coexist. So never treat reasons as weapons, treat them instead as pointers you can use to guide others attention to relevant considerations. Finally, I think we can all take a big step together towards collective wisdom by upgrading our mental picture of what a reasonable idea looks like. So going back 2000 years, uh, philosophers have been extremely smitten by the idea that a reasonable belief sort of sits atop an edifice of evidence or other reasons, good reasons, and that that's what makes good ideas good or reasonable beliefs reasonable. It turns out for subtle reasons that that's actually uh, incorrect, but we also know now that that idea exacerbates something psychologists called confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is the idea, is, is grabbing onto an idea and then trying to find evidence to support it from the bottom up, so to speak. And if you have the idea that uh, support, evidential support is enough to make an idea reasonable, that exacerbates your tendency to, to be misled by that bias. In the book, I argue that instead we can replace that picture with a picture of a reasonable belief as one that can withstand questioning. That goes back to this original Socratic conception of what should we should treat as reasonable. And I argue that if we go back to that Socratic conception of what's reasonable, we can actually um, make real headway towards becoming wise stewards of our planet. Um, to, to give you a uh, an image to attach to that picture I just talked about. The, my co the cover of my book contains uh, uh, the picture of a, of a head with bad ideas, misinformation, uh, bouncing off of it in various ways. That diagram was based on one of the illustrations I did for the book where I pre present a picture of what a reasonable idea looks like as one that can fend off um, questions and challenges of various kinds. And if we make that shift in our standard of what counts as reasonable, I think we can do a whole lot to inoculate ourselves against the worst forms of cognitive contagion. So thank you for your attention. Join me in helping to spread mental immunity and together we'll change the world. Thank you, Andy. Wow, so much food for thought and it couldn't be more timely. Let's dig in. So I'd like to start by asking you a little bit about yourself and growing up in Pittsburgh. Um, both of your parents were college professors. Your dad, Robert Norman, gave what you call the dinosaur speech at your elementary school graduation. Can you tell us a little bit about that and why it became important to you? <laughs> uh, yeah, of course. Uh, so I went to 
elementary school at East Hills School. And my father, who was a, a professor at Gispia at, at Pitt, was asked to give the commencement speech. And he had been reading articles in Scientific America, American that speculated that dinosaurs might actually have been warm-blooded. And uh, this was quite, quite the talk in the science world at the time. And so when my dad gave this talk, he actually, one of his, the lessons he drew in his commencement speech uh, was that uh, we should all, all of the graduating students should be ready to unlearn things that our teachers had taught us. And when my dad uh, shared this pearl of wisdom, there were a bunch of uh, elementary school teachers on stage who looked distinctly um, out of sorts about this particular message. <laughs> but uh, it stuck with me. And I've come to think that unlearning is as important as learning, in fact. Um, uh, another way to think about it, we tend to think of learning as additive, that it's taking in information and adding it to the mind's stockpile. But it's also, of course, important that we remove uh, falsehoods and bad ideas from our mind as well, and then organize what remains into coherent patterns. So I, I talk about subtractive learning as an important part of what we all need to do to become wiser. and. Um, and I think if we all focused uh, maybe half as hard on unlearning the wrong things as we do on learning the right things, uh, we might end up with a better world. That's great. That's great. What a great story. And your mom, of course, Leanne Ellison Norman, is known for her peace activism and establishing the Pittsburgh Peace Institute. So um, I'm wondering about the fact that you say that your work is intended to make the world a better place. And if that was influenced at all by your mom. Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> my, my mom's been such a huge influence on me. Uh, I was just speaking with her this morning, Stephanie, and mentioned that you and I would be uh, talking this afternoon and, and she uh, passed along her regards. She's a big fan of your work. Um, yeah, my, my mom is just a fortunate force of nature and has been for as long as I can remember. Uh, she cares passionately about justice and peace and human well-being, and she's made huge sacrifices uh, in her career and in her life to make the world a better place. And, you know, she's experienced a lot of adversity uh, in, in the course of that, but, um, but her courage and her passion and her care, caring for, for others has been a constant source of, of inspiration for me. Uh, I feel very fortunate to have been raised by uh, uh, two such wonderful parents. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. And um, my kids also went to East Hills, but I was never asked to give the commencement speech. <laughs> um, all right. On a serious note there, you've talked about some very strong values in that statement, um, justice, peace, caring. Mm -hmm. And a big part of your book that really struck me is your statement that values are subjective. Um, can you talk about that? Yeah. Um, so there's a, a widespread assumption, I think, that values are subjective. And when people say that, they often mean, well, they can, they can mean two either of two things. They can mean that values are the products of minds. And of course they are. If, if, if we lived in a universe where no minds existed, it's, it's hard to imagine how values would enter into a world like that. Um, but sometimes when we say values are subjective, we just mean that they're fundamentally arbitrary or fundamentally a matter of choice. And I actually think that's deeply mistaken. Most of our values are not subjective in that sense. Um, and yet when difficult moral and value questions arise, a lot of times people become uncomfortable and they try to put an end to the discussion by saying, oh, well, it's all just subjective. And you can do this to cut short a, uh, an uncomfortable inquiry. But if you do, you deprive yourself of a chance to deepen your understanding of right and wrong. So um, I actually, uh, in the book, I describe the idea that values are subjective um, 
when it functions in this way as a mental immune disruptor. It actually disrupts the kind of dialogue, uh, either with yourself or with others, that can enrich your understanding. Um, and so when we continually cut those dialogues short, um, our, our understanding of morality doesn't, doesn't grow and become more nuanced. So, so uh, I think there's, there's some very simple objective facts about right and wrong that it's worth remembering uh, because it helps to helps can help us shed this this dysfunctional uh, belief. Um, kindness is objectively more conducive to human flourishing than cruelty is. So there are objective reasons for preferring kindness over cruelty. And you can say the exact same thing about justice. It's, it's objectively more conducive to human flourishing than injustice. Honesty is, uh, for the most part, much more conducive to human flourishing than dishonesty. And these are the reasons we value these things so highly. Um, and it's worth remembering that our preference for honesty and justice and kindness is not merely arbitrary. It's not subjective in that sense. There are very good objective reasons for preferring these things. And so we need to overcome this idea that values and morality are merely subjective. That assumption is not serving us well. I, I love that. I love that barometer of what what serves humanity, what, and when you have that measurement, then you can say, yes, it is, they can be objective, they can be measured. I, I, would, I would add that I think that, that the well-being of other conscious creatures matters as well. Yeah. So humanity is a good place to start when we try to build a reality-based ethics. But um, I think we need to move pretty quickly beyond the interests of our species alone, because anybody who believes that kicking puppies is wrong is already partway down the road towards realizing that other sentient creatures matter too. Yes, and especially when we're looking at things like climate change and other um, issues that affect all of us. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Well, let's go to the book, and it actually took us to the book, um, even though we were talking about your, your mom's values there. You open with a pretty poignant scene of the Tree of Life shooting and explain that Bowser's derangement was fed by his failure to question ideas that were central to his identity, and at the same time, that failure was made into an ex existential threat by the internet. I think a lot of people are, are curious to hear your thoughts about the internet and its role in all of this. Yeah. Um, so my family has a personal connection with the Tree of Life because my two sons attended daycare uh, in the same building where the horrific shooting occurred. Uh, and so the opening pages of the book contrast uh, a really touching scene that happened there when I picked up my sons there one one day, and then the horrific shooting, which happened several years later. Um, so we know some things about Robert Bowers, the perpetrator of that, of that shooting. He was deeply immersed in a kind of Christian nationalism uh, and, and anti-Semitic ideology. And he became so invested in these ideologies that online fear mongers actually managed to hijack his mind and turn him in and basically weaponize Robert Bowers. So his ability to distinguish fact from fiction had been deeply compromised. And I think we have a new scientific way of understanding that phenomenon. His, his mind's immune system which, and the, the function of a mental immune system is to spot and remove bad ideas. But Robert Bauer's mind was just full of toxic, poisonous, and just false beliefs that turned him into someone who slaughtered 11 innocents. Um, and with the internet now spreading disinformation in ways that 
we're struggling to counter, uh, unhinged thinking has become, I think, it kind of an existential threat to us all. I mean, if nothing else, it's preventing much needed action on climate change. And, and if we don't address that problem very soon, we're in deep trouble. So the ready availability and the easy transmissibility of misinformation across the internet is a huge part of the problem we face today. But the fact that the neglect and abuse of mental immune systems has dramatically weakened our resistance. It's not that all of us are, are dramatically susceptible to the same ideas that Robert Bowers was infected with, for example. Um, but, it, but there are very good reasons for thinking that our mental immune systems are functioning at a fraction of their true potential to make us wise, uh, wise beings. Um, and there, there are social reasons for this, sociological, there are psychological reasons for this. And if we don't, either we need to do away with the internet or we need to learn how to inoculate minds against the worst forms of cognitive contagion. I don't think we can, we can have both and I don't see the internet going away. So uh, I think the book's prescription for strengthening mental immune systems uh, is actually an existential, it's a solution to I think an existential problem. Thank you, thank you. I'd, I'd like to, in our time left, talk more about that search for a better way to think that um, strengthening our immune system. And in the book, several times you use the word wise and you just used it again. And I love that, that we're, it's about becoming a wiser version of ourselves, as you say, and that all of us can let our identity get in the way of clear thinking. You also say that, um, or my thought in reading your book is that it's such a humane and hum humble approach. And can you talk about why humility is so important in this process? Mm. Yeah, so going all the way back to ancient Greece, one of my philosophical heroes, Socrates, uh, would wander the streets of Athens asking some of the most difficult and interesting and fascinating questions that we face. And he'd often end the discussions, just scratching his head and walking away saying, I really don't know the answer. He, he exemplified a kind of humility that he argued was essential for, for the kind of inquiry that can make us wiser. So when we assume we have all the answers or when we assume we basically have it all figured out, um, you're really not motivated to learn more, to grow, to, to become wiser. Uh, and so, arguably, arrogance can disrupt your capacity to learn. It's a mental immune disruptor in, in, my, in my terms. And at least a partial antidote to that is, is humility, learned humility. Um, now, Socrates would humble his conversational partners by making them look silly in conversation. He wasn't always the kindest interlocutor, but I think we can actually take the famous Socratic method, um, reshape it using the tools of modern science into an even more powerful mind inoculant. In fact, in the book, I actually take the Socratic method and refine it into something I call a mind vaccine and, and argue that that mind vaccine can take us a fair ways towards um, herd immunity to, to cognitive contagion. Thank you. Can these ideas be taught to children? And I'm thinking about Mr. Rogers, who you also mentioned in that chapter and his neighborhood. And I'm wondering if there's a value in encouraging wonder and curiosity as Mr. Roger did as a way to promote mental immunity. Yeah. Um, I'd, I'd say absolutely yes. Um, when I was growing up in Pittsburgh many years ago, it was kind of cool among the, I don't know, 10 or 12 year old boys to, to look down our noses at Mr. Rogers as kind of for, for little kids, right? Or for babies. But man, I've come to respect 
what what he did. His legacy is is marvelous. Um, yeah, um, I've actually seen there was actually a, a uh, movement to teach philosophy to children, um, and you can act. And kids are wonderfully responsive to well-framed philosophical questions. So you can gather the kids around the story rug and say, um, hey, guys, we just saw this happen. You know, little Susie actually hurt little Johnny, even though she was following the rules. Did little Susie do something wrong or right? And you'll see kids kind of trying wrestling with this question. Um, and then you you can flip the question around, right? Uh, little Johnny actually broke the rules, but he helped little Susie. Did Johnny do something? Did, did he did he do something wrong? And you'll see kids grappling with these questions and, and you see light bulbs going off when they do it. It's marvelous to see. And I think you can enliven a mind by getting them to explore value questions in conversation with one with one another and with a, a skilled adult. I, I think it's a marvelous way to begin inoculating minds. And I really hope that we'll reinvent education in this country to incorporate some of these lessons from the new science of mental immunity. Thank you, that, that would be marvelous. That's uh, hopeful. Um, so speaking of about having these hard conversations, the section that you call six ideas um, really struck me that we can give ourselves passives by saying some of those six ideas like beliefs are private. Um, we have the right to believe what we want. And then the biggest one, I'm going to read it, was number six. The questioning a person's core commitments is fundamentally intolerant, mean-spirited, offensive, or unkind. I think a lot of us are conflict averse and we, even if we don't, but yeah, there's a level that we believe that. Yeah. Um, so how do we get past this and how can we have those hard and truthful and productive conversations with family and friends? Yeah, my grandmother used to say, never discuss politics or religion with polite company. And I know that that was a, a rule of thumb designed to prevent, you know, dinner, I don't know, dinner guests from, from developing acrimony among friends. The problem when you, when you avoid those hard questions, though, divisions start to form in our world, our worldview start to drift apart. And then when the time comes to, to actually dialogue again, to try to bring them back together, we struggle to do it because the, the mental muscles of are, are, are out of shape, so to speak. So I actually think avoiding the hard questions is buying yourself a little bit of comfort or a little, a, a little conflict avoidance at the long-term expense of our, of our collective well-being. We actually need to have these deep, engaging value conversations um, often to keep our worldviews synced up and so that we can create a flourishing sense of common purpose. Um, now, how do you do it? Uh, it can be hard to have these conversations, especially if, say, members of your family have gone down conspiracy theory rabbit holes and you're trying to reconnect with them. Um, there's a whole art to helping people like that that I probably I won't open that can of worms here, even though the book talks a little bit about it. Um, it's far easier to prevent a mind infection than it is to cure one, at least or I like to say that an ounce of mind inoculation is worth a pound of, of, uh, of cult deprogramming. <laughs> um, uh, some researchers in this field say that it's easier to pre-bunk than debunk, which is kind of another way of putting the same point, I think. Um, but if, if you enter into dialogue about ethics or politics or religion with an open mind and, and a willingness to listen first, 
on bringing patients to the task, you'll almost always find that people on the so-called other side, they mean well, they, they have, they share our core values almost always. Uh, and, but if we do what our lightning speed internet connected culture is training us to do, which is jump in and start fault finding, the conversation will go south fast. So we need to turn off our electronic devices, our Twitter feeds, and get back to having long involved conversations with our friends. And as you get better at that, start doing it with the friends of your friends or people who you know a little bit less well. And you can get very good at having these conversations in a constructive way if you practice the art. It's, it's, not, it's not rocket science but it does take practice. And fortunately, it's a joyful exercise that, um, that, that pays, pays you back in so many ways. Thank you, thank you. It's, um, it's inspiring to think about getting good at that art. Um, so I thank you for that in your book. Thank you. I, I mean, I've been fortunate as a philosopher, my day job for a lot of years was just to lead conversations about values in, in classrooms. and. And I've learned so much from my students and, and if approached in the right spirit, a good conversation can teach you almost all, everything you really need to know. So in closing, I would like to ask what you envision when you say that we can make the world a better place. I guess there are many dimensions on which uh, <laughs> there's room for improvement. Um, I would like to, so I'll focus on the one at the, the one I that's at the heart of my book. Um, I think that we can develop our mental immune systems. We can we can develop our immunity to bad ideas far beyond where our educational systems and our culture currently take us. Um, and when we do we're literally developing wisdom. So I actually think that the concepts of this new science of mental immunity can let us get a practical handle on how to cultivate wisdom in a way that uh, we, we've always struggled with. So, I mean, philosophers have been seeking wisdom for a long time, but we haven't done a particularly noteworthy job of spreading it far and wide. And it's not even clear that trained philosophers are measurably wiser than the the general populace, but I I do honestly hope that this emerging science, which I've been fortunate enough to stumble upon, uh, could could really help humanity evolve rapidly in the direction of of actually deserving what the scientific name we've given our species Homo sapiens means wise man, a wise human. Um, Maybe it's time we lived up to that designation and maybe cognitive immunology, the science of mental immunity will help us get there. Thank you, Andy. That was beautiful. Thank you for this wisdom. Thank you for your book. Andy Norman, author of Mental Immunity, Infectious Ideas, Mind Parasites, and the Search for a Better Way. Signed copies are available at White Whale Bookstore. Thank you so much, Andy, and thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm.